Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Thinking Like a Lawyer. I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law. I am joined as per usual these days by my partner in various misdemeanors, Catherine Rubino. How are you? <laughs> Hi there, how are you? I'm not going to go with felony, but you know, I mean, there, there, sure. I'm sure there's a few local ordinances that I uh, prefer of. not to think too hard about that, but it seems likely. Fair enough. So uh, yeah, we are here. Again, as we said, from above the lawn, we are chatting today about the week's events. Mm -hmm. uh, how have you been? You know, I'm based in New York, so coronavirus is actually down here, unlike large swaths of the country, which is which is encouraging to see. Yes, it's it's so far down that the governor of your state is trying to ban people from some of those states from coming to New York. Which yeah, um, I mean. It's, Seems I don't know, illegal. I think it's just really funny because it wasn't that long ago that Andrew Cuomo was quite upset when Rhode Island and other states tried to do the exact same thing to New York. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, shoes on the other foot. Yeah. Well, and it's, I talk a little bit about this the other day, like, it, it's not just that uh, he got mad when other states did it and called it questionably legal, um, indeed, probably very illegal, uh, <laughs> but when they did it, they actually had something close to a colorable argument for making that sort of a discrimination against citizens based on their state. Because at the time, New York was like hundreds of times worse than every other state. Mm -hmm. But now he's kind of making fine lines between, well, California, a hot spot, is not enough of a hot spot, but Utah. Those are the people that we can't have coming to the <laughs> could, coming to New York, or they could bring the disease. Even though the difference between them is, as hotspots is negligible, and more people come from California than from Utah, yeah, like there's, I mean, it seems pretty arbitrary. And it seems like if you are truly concerned about people bringing the disease to the state, you would be very concerned about Californians coming. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the internal logic of it is something that has any efficacy falls apart. But uh, beyond that, like it's just hard to imagine that if anybody did choose to challenge this and again maybe people won't because they don't you know they don't want to have to get into it attorney generals have more important things to do you know but if anybody did want to get into this it would seem pretty difficult to figure out what the compelling interest is in barring utah and not california and how this is incredible and this seems incredibly poorly tailored to mm protect anybody. The goals that they but, say they but, have. But, you know, he was super upset when other states did it. And now that he's got, as you said, he's got the upper hand, it, it's time, all bets are off. <laughs> I mean, listen, I, I'm not I'm not a particularly big Andrew Cuomo fan, but a lot of his political posturing has a kind of schoolyard feel to it, right? Ha ha, yeah. now I've got you. Yeah. And your mom too, you know? <laughs> that, that's a good point. There's a very posturing feel to a lot of what happens as opposed mm. to, you know, actually doing stuff, which I mean, credit, New York is in pretty good shape right now. But and listen, not, not great shape, obviously, you know, we still have a lot of people mm -hmm. um, recovering and still have a lot of an active infections and, and, and whatever, but definitely in the correct direction in New York. And, and I think that it's definitely taken taking a step in the right direction. This is how we'll tie this into, well, I guess it was already a legal conversation, but to tie it back, Cuomo has always struck me as, you know, he was former attorney general. He's always struck me as one of those lawyers. There are kind of two sorts of lawyers in the litigation world. It always struck me. There's kind of the, and this is a terminology that I know is used in legislatures as well, but the show horse and workhorse, uh, mm. there is, there is mm. definitely the lawyer who gains their success by knowing everything about what's going on, who takes the time to learn the law and learn all the ins and outs and explain what's in the record and are masters of all of that. And there's also the lawyer who wings it and just is charming and, and or a bully and uses that to get away with things. And Cuomo has always felt very strongly the for, uh, that 
well, I guess I reversed them there, so I shouldn't say former, the, the show ho- horse type and mm-hmm. the idea that people are starting to get bored with wearing masks, so he's going to start banning Alabama from coming here uh, seems very much in that vein. Yeah. But, you know, it's a thing, uh, and COVID is still a crisis, which is why uh, we're still talking about it on our Above the Law COVID cast, where we talk about COVID and the law. But right. uh, it seems that even though there are still problems, the federal government is cutting back on uh, COVID testing centers. So there's that. Well, if you don't know you're infected, then are you even really infected at all? I mean, it's... Ha ha, got you on that one. (laughs) Was was it Basho who said, uh, what if a tree falls in the woods? Uh, um, Yeah. (laughs) You know, obviously, I think there, a lot of us suspect there are political motivations behind it, but... You know, government's well, argument quite is quite a bit of polling just... data that I think is being reacted to as opposed yeah. to science and medical data. <laughs> but I mean, the government's ostensible argument is they're trying to cut costs, and that's valuable because, you know, if you're trying to cut costs, you're not alone. In today's climate, a five figure e discovery bill per month is steep. Don't pay that. Use Logical to reduce expense and control your discovery process. Get started today for only $250 per matter, and they'll waive migration costs from competing platforms. For more information, visit Logical.com slash LTN. That's Logic with a K, C-U-L-L dot com forward slash LTN. So what else is going on? What has been keeping you busy this week? I'm not sure I remember this week. <laughs> so it's like that, huh? I feel like I'm in that stage of quarantine. Like I don't, I don't really remember. Well, I guess, I guess yesterday I wrote a story, which kind of dovetailed nicely, I think, with a story that you covered about a different law school. But um, there's an Instagram account that's going around, uh, Black at Harvard Law, that it's a, a site where people can anonymously submit stories of all sorts of racist in- interactions, whether they're overtly racist or microaggressions or somewhere in between that actual law students, current and former, that have gone to Harvard Law have experienced. And it's it's quite illuminating. And it's absolutely, if you're thinking about getting into the legal profession, if you're already in the legal profession, you know, it's it's something everyone should really check out. It was it was it was pretty shocking. Yeah. Unfortunately it wasn't as shocking as you would think. I mean it was bad, well, but sure. it's also, I mean, our you know, no longer working with us on a day-to-day basis, but our friend and former co-host of this show, Ellie Mistal, was, you know, a Harvard Law Mm -hmm. grad who was a black guy. And so, yeah, I'd heard, obviously, we've heard over the years a lot of those sorts of stories. So it it didn't seem as shocking, even though it was still disappointing. But yeah, no, law schools aren't perfect places when it comes to these issues. Certainly, I, I, I don't, labor under the misconception that there's any sort of like a, a pure bastion that that is somehow eliminated all traces of racism from their shores. But, you know, there's a, a lot of professors or, or perhaps a lot of stories about a few professors that are shocking, you know. Maybe you're just not biologically predisposed to become a lawyer, for example, is a thing that yeah. a Black person at Harvard Law was told. <laughs> wow. Uh, another professor um, called a Black woman the name of the other black woman in in the section. And instead of an apology, the professor just said, well, you know, one major cause of wrongful convictions is that white people are unable to tell the difference between different black people. Yeah. That's not an apology, you guys. (laughs) Yeah. It really does stand in stark contrast to another story of the week, which was Rutgers Law Mm. School, who released a statement. I, a lot of schools and law firms have released statements, obviously, in response to a lot to the issues of the day. Mm-hmm. But the Rutgers Law faculty stepped it up a bit, I, I would say. Uh, from my perspective, I thought it was probably the strongest statement I've seen anybody write when it comes to addressing racism and mm-hmm. talked about what the school has done, what the school frankly admits what the school could be doing better, opens up about what they see as poss- as non-exhaustive list of concrete actions to take. And they were not purely symbolic actions either. There were a lot of real steps that they said that they wanted to engage in and work with the students and community leaders on. It was a, it was a real thing. It, it's a lesson that I think a lot of law schools and law firms should uh, try to learn from. 
yeah, that was that was a good one. And and I think you're you're right that a big part of kind of the the reckoning in the legal profession is not just what to do, but but what have they done wrong historically? Yeah. I wrote a story today about the law firm Anti Racism Alliance, which over 125 law firms, including some of the biggest and most prestigious law firms in the country, have signed on to, which is a great great thing. And you know. But even their point person, you know, talked about in anticipating uh, a steep learning curve and that there will be bumps in the roads as we try to uh, figure all this out. And, and you know, it's great that that pro bono and anti-racism efforts will have more resources available to them as a result of all these firms kind of signing on, both in terms of hours and, and the other kind of big point was access to, you know, decision makers that a lot of firms have that may not be available to folks who work exclusively in the nonprofit sphere. Um, so there's just a lot of a lot of opportunities with this alliance, but there's also a steep learning curve as we try to undo all the bad things that have that we've done historically. You know, it's an ongoing struggle and it's one that I in the past I've written an article where I make the point, and I think it's still true, that one of the real shortcomings for lawyers in addressing these issues is that lawyers like to have finality. Like mm. lawyers like to think that I done something and, you know, I went through the process and maybe I had to appeal, but I got done with the process and now I'm done. Right. Uh, whereas this is something that requires constantly recognizing that it is an unfinished job. You know, it rubs the mentality of lawyers in a way that they're not used to, I think. It's a very, very astute point. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's what I come here. Yeah, that's what you come here for is to hear me be astute. Is that is that why people? Are I mean, here? I just like I just like that word being tossed around. Um, it's yeah. better than words like sophistry being tossed around. So. Oh yeah, is that a, is that a word you've recently tossed around? I mean, I I almost did. I actually erased it from a draft uh, <laughs> moments before I hit publish on it, and did I'm a little glad peek I, behind the editing process here. <laughs> and I'm glad I did because as soon as I was done, almost simultaneously with my publishing, Mark Joseph Stern from Slate had published his article about the same subject and put the word sophistry in like the first paragraph. And I was like, whoo, avoided that. It, that could have been embarrassing. Looked like we, it's like showing up in the same outfit. Like I would have been like, no, 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 no. So, uh, so who's the sophist? Uh, Judge Naomi Rao, who joined the DC circuit very recently, a uh, mm -hmm. Trump apparatchik who got themselves onto the DC circuit, uh, wrote an opinion that doesn't really read like an opinion. It reads... It reads like, I mean, sophistry is a very good word for it, which is why both of us uh, wanted to use it and one of us did. Uh, very, it, very appropriate. <laughs> it, uh, almost half the opinion is not laying out an argument for why Michael Flynn should be allowed to, you know, plead guilty and still not be sentenced. But uh, it, more than half the opinion is her responding to the dissent, which a life lesson for anybody listening who's, you know, not in practice yet. But you have to address the arguments of the other side, certainly. Sure. But you also don't want the arguments of the other side to become the entirety of what you're writing because all it manages to do is inform the reader that, uh-oh, the other side might have the better of the argument. Because all you're doing is flagging how much more <laughs> difficult it is to believe you than the other side. And when you spill over half your opinion on it, that's a, that's a bad Not sign. A good luck. Yeah, and, and in this case, it was, it was a necessary move on her part because it, she had no real affirmative case to lay out. What she spent most of her time trying to say was, well, here's reasons not to believe the dissent, so by default you have to believe me, which isn't how things work. But yeah, uh, it's it was a real Franken opinion. Of, so, but she, she wrote the, the majority opinion for the yes. D.C. Circuit, so I guess that means that Flynn is, is off the hook, or...? Well, it, that is that is where it would currently stand. It was sent back to Judge Sullivan to render, you know, his leave such that the right. case could be dropped. Uh, but rather than do that, Judge Sullivan cleverly said, well, if I go forward with this case, I have to grant leave. So I am issuing a stay in this <laughs> case to delay it because he assumes that he will, A, file for an en banc hearing. But even if he didn't, 
I'm not altogether sure that there won't be one anyway, because as as I believe Steve Ledek uh, pointed out on Twitter, they have a procedure at the D.C. Circuit where any judge can request sua sponte a mm. en banc hearing. So there's a reasonable likelihood that it's going to happen whether he judge sullivan appeals or not but my guess my guess is they will wait around to see if he appeals but gotcha. it could happen either way it, no it was a real mess uh it it managed as a conservative opinion to ignore judicial restraint textualism and the underlying logic of original public understanding all <laughs> in the space of a few pages so i mean you got to use the arguments that are available to you, Joe. <laughs> uh, I mean, if if you're writing backwards, it certainly it certainly puts you in a bind. If you begin <laughs> with the result and work backwards, it's it, it creates for some mischief. Yeah, it's the uh, opposite of the balls and strikes uh, cliche at this point that conservative yeah, no, justices I mean, like to hang their head on. Yeah, it, it was it was rough. It, it, what, what was really weird about it was I felt like it was rough in ways. I mean, I don't want to give her life lessons, but uh, it did strike <laughs> don't, I don't think she's listening, Joe. <laughs> yeah, it, but it did strike me as though there were ways in which one could write that opinion and get that result that were not patently ridiculous, but she eschewed all those mm -hmm. and went straight for, look, I know the text says this, but who needs textualism? I mean... uh, which was probably a uh, long term for her judicial philosophy, a, a bad move. Well, I mean, unless it gets her on the Supreme Court. Well, right. That's the logic. That's actually what we should do. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do that in a in a future episode. We we should we should set an actual like Vegas line on the nice. the odds that certain people end up on the Supreme Court. That's pretty impressive. We'll work on that. We'll unveil that in a future episode here. That that I think that's a good move. And if folks have particular jurists uh, that they would like us to set a line on, you should send them to us at tips at above the law dot com and you can have SCOTUS line as your subject line and this way we'll be able to gather them all if there's anyone so we don't miss any big names that we should be talking about. And obviously the results of the election play into who of it course. will be, but of you know, we'll, we'll we'll act as though it's a fifty fifty election as far as the purposes of our completely fake gambling goes. <laughs> I'm sure there's somewhere in the world you could bet on this. Yeah. I mean, there is somewhere in this world where you can bet on this, I think was something that you've mused about before. And I'm sure there is. And I'm sure it's in like Scotland or Ireland. That seems to be where everybody bets on things that yes. are unconventional. But it definitely does. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, we, we should we should start this going. We'll get a little league or something. So that's been going on. Is there anything else? Uh, oh, um, it appears as though while we've been doing all this, that Mary Trump, uh, her book, her tell-all book that, well, not the administration, Trump's mm. brother, basically as a proxy for the administration, right. has sued to, you know, prior restrain the publication of that book, and uh, that got tossed out of court already. Well, prior so, restraints have been roundly rege <laughs> roundly <yes>. rejected. <laughs> The Supreme Court has roundly rejected prior restraint, the line yeah. you're looking for, I think. There you go. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is this is not a surprising move. This is was not a did not seem like a winning argument at any point. The Big Lebowski school of law comes through yet again. Uh, yeah. as <laughs> everything accurate. I need to know about being a lawyer, I learned from the Big Lebowski. Although honestly, I don't think I would have passed evidence if I hadn't watched Law and Order. Interesting. See, because like, that's weird. Because I'll I'll be honest, my uh, maybe you know we went to different law schools, so uh, it could be different approaches. But for me, evidence was like criminal procedure. I thought had some law and order elements to it. But for me, evidence ninety percent of the questions were hearsay questions, which I don't think ever really comes up in law and order as much. Well, I mean, I remember our exam was um, more than it was. It was multiple cho short answer for most of the the test, um, not like essay questions. And as I was studying, every time there was like, I was like, oh, I remember there was an episode of Law and Order, and in that case, it went like this. And I was like, oh, I see the differences between the hypo <laughs> hypothetical and this. And it just it just seemed like every case that I had, I was like, oh yeah, I remember that episode of Law and Order. <laughs> yeah, I was also in law school, so watching a lot of Law and Order at the time, so I had a, a, quite a few to to draw on. For my exam, it was like the 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 crux of my exam 
were a series mm-hmm. of questions where you had to delineate the difference between this isn't hearsay versus this is hearsay, but there's an exception to it. Sure. Uh, and and that, that distinction, which both get the same result, but from different ways, that, different was the, reasons. <laughs> that was the fine line that you had to work out to be right. But these are the sorts of struggles that you go through to get through law school and achieve a diploma, which one would think would be enough for you to then go be a lawyer, but it's not because our country has an archaic bar exam process that makes people take another test despite having just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a professional degree because we don't trust the law schools, which is probably a deeper problem. Well, I was going to say, I mean, in fairness, there are a lot of law schools that don't do a great job about how, how, about getting kids to pass the bar exam. I think that there were eight or 10, I can't, I think 10 schools on the latest list of the ABA non-compliance list for the the standard that says that within two years of graduation, 75% of graduates need to have passed the, a bar exam. And there, there, there are a bunch of law schools on that list. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get that. The, but the problem is, well, there, there's multiple problems there. One is the ABA has, after years of kind of rubber stamping schools, the ABA tried to crack down on those schools and instead got sued, which is problematic on a lot of levels because we should be relying upon the ABA to accredit people. Mm-hmm. And if they're not going to be in a position to do that without getting sued, then someone else needs to be in that role. Uh, we need some sort of regulation of law schools. Now, I think... Mm-hmm. Ideally, we would be in a position where we regulate law schools sufficiently well that we can trust anybody who goes to them, if they pass and get clear to their diploma, then they are subject matter competent. And then we can we can and should still have ethics investigations and ethics tests and probationary periods, all those sorts of issues can still be part of the licensing process, but Mm -hmm. there's no reason to go to law school and then take another test to prove that you understood law school. And the only reason it's still, well, the only reason it's still around is because tradition and archaic, it's from an era when we used to let random people who did, like Cardozo, who didn't go to law school become lawyers by taking tests. And after they'd apprenticed and stuff, it was there to replace the uh, the law school diploma. But now that people have to go to law school, it really doesn't serve the purpose it was supposed to, other than we have bad law schools, which should beg the question not, well, that's why we need a bar exam, but why do we allow bad law schools? <laughs> well, that seems like a, a much more difficult thing to conquer. <laughs> right. But <laughs> then. Sure. But the excitement of the current crisis is the increased interest in pushing for diploma privilege as an emergency measure since people can't figure out how they can do in-person bar exams without everyone getting sick. So folks are asking for it. And actually, one of the more triumphant stories of the last few days is the deans from Utah asked and received an emergency diploma privilege exemption in Utah. And after that, Washington has gotten the same thing. Now, the Oregon deans, as well as a lot of Oregon law students are pushing for it in their state. And in Minnesota, without help from the deans per se, a few recent grads put together their own petition and sent it to the Supreme Court on Monday, more or less assuming that it would languish uh, as or or get a quick, yeah, we don't care kids. Uh, And instead, the uh, Supreme Court got back to them and said, we're opening this up for a public comment period, and uh, let's take this under advisement. So there are good stories out there of people taking in the own, their own initiative to push for this. That is encouraging. Certainly better, particularly as we're not seeing the end of corona anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. It's been eventful. But uh, I think if there's any theme to this week... It was probably, why can't people do things right? Between why indeed? Why indeed? Team Cuomo and Rao and the, uh, the, the attempt to get the book banned. And, you know, and we're coming right off of the attempt to get John Bolton's book, Prior Restrained. Like, well, what is it about these basic legal concepts that people don't seem to understand? Well, they don't give them the result they want, like what Rao said, right? Like, yeah. sometimes you have to abandon principles in order to get the result you want. It's a disheartening day for people who have, have gone through their, like, well, 1L year probably is sufficient to get most of these <laughs> lessons. Aww. 
that's it, it is deeply discouraging, I suppose. But here we are. And I, I don't remember like the days are all blurring into each other. But it's been since last week that we had the whole Jeffrey Berman attempted firing too, right? Oh gosh! Yeah, like nobody yes, that can was do last things weekend. right. They, and and that's just the that's the Administrative Procedures Act. Just like not an Administrative Procedures Act. Gah, no, sorry. That was my other topic from last. That one we did do last week, the Administrative Procedures Act. I definitely remember we did that part last <laughs> week. But no, the um, but coming right off of the Administrative Procedures Act screw up, they managed to screw up an agency process by saying under the like trying to pull some Vacancies Act garbage, despite the fact that Berman isn't somebody that's actually been put in that job by them because yeah. they couldn't figure out how to get somebody in that job before the deadline went out. So the court actually appointed him with a term, according to the court, that holds until they nominate some and confirm somebody else. So they can't fire him. To, oh, it was, <laughs> and then uh, Trump took the stance that, you, that he could fire him, which is iffy. There's, there's a Washington Post article that kind of walks through exactly the overlapping legislation that suggests that maybe Trump could fire him despite the fact that he's not been put in that job by Trump, but by the courts. But mm -hmm. even with that, the process to replace him would not end with with uh, their stated replacement getting that job. Who uh, SEC chairman? It was it was such a mess, and it's un yet another one that was an unforced error, like the APA decision that we talked about, where the uh, DACA was DACA right. was upheld not so much because the there was a majority of the Supreme Court that wanted it upheld, but because literally the administration couldn't figure out how to cross its T's correctly. And here we have yet another instance where they could have gotten somebody to replace Berman, but they couldn't have done it the way they did it. So it became a huge problem. Uh, why can't people do things right? Yeah, I mean, although perhaps it has has done its ultimate goal, which is stopped the amount of time we're talking about the administration's botched response to COVID-19. I guess, yeah. And it, I mean, it, it's a it, kind of a, a very cynical worldview, but. And it does appear that they got, they did succeed in getting Berman replaced, although they did not replace him with anyone that they wanted. Instead, he will be replaced by his longtime deputy, which is the proper line right. of succession move. Right. But why can't people do things right? Because, I mean, we live in like the worst timeline. The rules just really aren't that difficult here. I mean, there are places in this world where rules are hard, but they, but these aren't these aren't this that hard. This is not it. This is not the hard one. Yeah, there are hard ones. This is not it. So uh, I can't believe we're almost at July. So that is crazy. I guess our next episode will actually be recorded in full summer. I feel like July is like the like historically. I grew up in New York City, you know, and and school uh, today. I think is graduation day for a bunch of bunch of kids. So yeah, I mean. Next week is like the official start of summer, and we are no closer to being done with coronavirus than we were in March. Well, maybe if we just ban people Ignore from it? certain states from coming here. I mean, um, <laughs> that seems to be our current strategy. Yeah, so thanks for joining today and chatting of about course. what's been going on. Kind of a wide-ranging discussion. No, I like that. I like, I like when we're just kind of loose about the, the events of the world. I feel like... That's that's just how we have to roll these days, you know? Fair enough. Yeah, anyway, thanks for joining us. You should be subscribing to the podcast, giving reviews, all of that good stuff. You should be reading Above the Law. Uh, follow I'm at Joseph Patrice on Twitter. She's at Catherine One. Check her out on The Jabot, which is a podcast that talks to folks about diversity in the legal profession. You should be listening to the Above the Law COVID cast, where we talk with people about the unexpected ways in which the pandemic will change the legal profession. You should listen to the other offerings of the Legal Talk Network. In particular, the 150th episode of Digital Edge is out, and uh, that celebration did include me. I was uh, one of the interviewees on that one, uh, and we had a lot of fun talking about legal technology on that one. So if you're interested in that, check that out. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, it. Till next week. Till next week. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. 
You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.